بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear viewers, welcome to you all to our regular weekly show Islam and Life. I am your host Raju Ali once again in front of you. As you all know, we are entering the month of Muharram, the first month of Holy Calendar of Hijrah. So today we choose a topic which is very relevant to our life, which is very important of the time, the topic of the history of Islamic calendar. To discuss about this topic and to make a best use of the calendar, today we invited our regular guest, the Honorable Vice Principal of Jamia Islamia Birmingham, Sheikh Faizul Hok Abdul Aziz, once again in our studio. Let's welcome him with a warm heart. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you very much for being here once welcome. again. I'm very delighted. Barakallah. Sheikh, as you know, uh, today we are entered uh, the holy month of Muharram. It's a very precious month, and today we choose a topic about the history of Islamic calendar. So, I would like to know, on behalf of our audience, what is Islamic calendar? What is the difference between the other calendars and the Islamic calendars? And why it is so important for the world context? as a believer's context and also how it's been created why there was there any calendar beforehand and what are the circumstances it would be in the future times as a believer's life mashallah assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen wa salatu wa salamu ala nabijina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in ومن تبعهم ودعا بدعوتهم وسلك مسلكهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي زدني علما Respective viewers, my beloved brothers and sisters we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every one of us who is watching this program, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant peace and tranquility uh, and blessings and mercy uh, to everybody watching this program uh, in the beginning of the Islamic New Year, 1439 Hijri. My brothers and my sisters, with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you have heard the brother saying that today's topic is the history of Islamic calendar. With the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll talk about the history of Islamic calendar. What is the motive behind it and what was the reason behind and who was the person who set up this calendar and why was it for the month of Muharram and why the Hijrah was selected, etc, etc. Inshallah, with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll try to cover this, inshallah. My brothers and my sisters, we are going through a very sad passage of time that uh, in this time, Currently, many of the places in the world, many of the brothers and sisters, they are facing the worst of the suffering ever the humanity have ever faced. We make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps everyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant everybody peace and tranquility. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide the ummah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy upon the entire mankind, the entire ummah. My brothers and my sisters, when the last month of the Islamic calendar, which is Zul Hijjah, and the first month of the Islamic calendar, which is Muharram, when they both march, when they both join together, we go through a really sad time. And many of the sad incidents took place in these two months. For example, in the month of Zul Hijjah, on the 18th of Zul Hijjah, the third Khalifa of Islam, Sayyiduna Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was very sadly assassinated on the 18th of Zul Hijjah. On the same month of Zul Hijjah, on the 27th of Zul Hijjah, the second Khalifa of Islam, Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, while he was leading the Fajr Salah, 
Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he was stopped by an Iranian man by the name Abu Lu'ulu, who was a fire worshipper. Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he could not bear the pain, and with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the first day of Islamic calendar, which is Muharram, Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu became shaheed. And then when the month of Muharram begins, on the 10th of Muharram, we have another sad scenario, which is the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the son of Sayyida Fatima to Zahra radiyallahu ta'ala anha, the leader of the youngsters of Jannah, Sayyiduna Hussain ibn Ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma, he was assassinated, he was made shaheed in the fields of Karbala. So when we go through this passage, the 18th of Zulhijjah, from there, and they come to the 10th of Muharram. These three weeks actually in Islamic history, it is a sad time. It is a very painful time. And on top of that, we have the suffering Muslim brothers and sisters currently. For example, the Rohingya brothers in uh, Myanmar, the brothers in Syria, and all the other places of the world. So when these two time comes, the two months march together, they mix together, they join together. We historically, we go through this pain of losing three of the great personalities from the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then on top of that, we have the suffering brothers and sisters who are currently suffering so much that they have to run away from their own countries. They've been massacred, they've been butchered, the genocide is committed against them. They've been, uh, as we say, ethnic cleansing going on against them. Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was made shaheed on the 18th of Zul Hijjah. He was the third Khalif of Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave his two daughters in his marriage. The name of the two daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were Umm Kulsum and Ruqayya radiallahu ta'ala an, anhuma. Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after his demise, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the Khalif who took the official uh, initiative in order to uh, make the copies of the Holy Quran. And Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu sent sef seven, made seven copies of the Quran, kept one to Al-Madinat al munawwara and then gave six to many of the Islamic cities at that time, like Mecca, uh, Kufa, Basra, Syria, etc., etc. Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was killed, he was assassinated in the month of Zulhijjah. Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, such a great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu, they are the leaders of the senior men of Jannah. Allahu Akbar. Allah. As far as Hussein and Hassan radiallahu anhu are concerned, they are the leaders of the young men of Jannah. And as far as the mature men of Jannah, Sayyiduna uh, Abu Bakr and Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they are the leaders of the mature men of Jannah. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the books of hadith when his virtues are mentioned. Subhanallah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned so many ahadith, numerous ahadith uh, with regards to the virtue of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. In one of the famous hadith, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has stated that if after me anyone was to be prophet, then it will definitely be Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. But because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no one will appear as a prophet until the day of judgment. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last and the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the end of the time. No prophet will come after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, if anyone was to come after me as a prophet, it will be Umar ibn al-Khattab. But because there is no prophet to come after me, therefore Umar ibn al-Khattab as well can't be a prophet. But he had the quality to be a prophet. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the seal of the prophethood. Upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophethood and the messengership from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to an end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated in the Quran, in Surah Al-Ahzab, uh, Jews number 22, that مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِزَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the father of your man. And he is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is the seal of all the prophets. I, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there wouldn't be any prophets coming until the end of the time. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if it was to continue the prophethood, Umar had the capacity to become a prophet. Allahu Akbar, okay. subhanallah, such a great man. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed verses in the Quran 
uh, according to the count of the some of the uh, scholars in 20 one or 22 places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down verses in the Quran according to the suggestion given by Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh. Such a great man. He gave the such suggestion and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the ayat in the Holy Quran, the verses in the Holy Quran. This is Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh. Once Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on the Mount Uhud. The Mount Uhud started to shake. The earthquake came in al-Madinat al-Munawwara. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there, Abu Bakr was there, Umar was there, and Uthman radiallahu anhu was there. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the mountain, Mount, settle down. On you, there is a prophet, there is a siddiq, and there is two shaheed. Allahu Akbar. I.e., referring to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu anhu, and Umar ibn al-Khattab, and Uthman ibn Affan, that they are the both shaheed. And siddiq is Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu anhu. After the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he himself once was on the Mount Uhud. And the Mount Uhud started to shake. Subhanallah, it said in the books of the hadith, that Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he whipped on the ground, the Mount Uhud, and he said, Oh Mount Uhud, settle down. Isn't Umar doing justice on you? Allahu Akbar. Straight away, the Mount started to stop, to, uh, uh, stop uh, the, the earthquake came to an end, and the Mount uh, stopped shaking. Allahu Akbar. So this was Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, regarding him, he, it said that he ruled for the, Allahu Akbar, uh, more than 100 square miles, 100,000 square miles in the world. It said that at the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he ruled more than, more than half of the world at that time, because America wasn't discovered then. So Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu ruled uh, the Islamic Khilafah expanded to more than half of the lands of the world. That Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, became shaheed on the first of Muharram. Therefore, when the Islamic New Year begins, Islamic calendar begins, there is no uh, celebrations, there is no fireworks, there is no uh, any kind of parties etc. etc. because it begins. First of all, it is not the Islamic culture to have these kind of things. Secondly, it begins with the sorrow that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the second Khalifa of Islam, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was assassinated, he was made shaheed on the first of Muharram. And then uh, on the 10th of Muharram, which is the day of Ashura, <coughs> Sayyiduna Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, the son-in-law of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was assassinated in the fields of Karbala uh, and, uh, in a very bad manner. Sayyiduna Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhum. So all this passage of time, it comes with uh, uh, lots of sorrows, with a lot of sadness, with, uh, uh, with the Muslim ummah losing great personalities, such as Sayyiduna Uthman ibn Affan, such as Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, such as Sayyiduna Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, etc., etc. And from the same point, the Islamic calendar begins as well. Now comes the question, what was the background of the Islamic calendar? Who was the person behind it? Who started it? And why is it from Muharram? Uh, why is it not from any other months? Why is it not from the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Why is it not from the day he became prophet? Why is it not from the day he died? So all these questions come. Inshallah, we'll try to discover and discuss, in, inshallah, uh, these issues in this program today, inshallah, with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and my sisters, uh, in the pre-Islamic era, what was happened that uh, all the other uh, groups or the, all the other people from the other uh, places of the world, they had their calendar. The Christians, they were following the Christian calendar, which is uh, uh, 2017. Uh, they were following that calendar from, the, uh, from Jesus, alayhi salatu wasalam, from Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam. Jewish community in the world as well, they had their own calendar and they used to follow that. And people in the Indian subcontinent as well, they had their calendar and they used to follow that. However, all these calendars in the world, they were rotating with the sun. They were the sun calendars, which were known as the solar calendars. They were planned and they were going according to the sun, the rotation of the sun. So they are known as the solar calendars, which go according to the sun. Whereas in Arabia, there wasn't any set calendars. Prior to the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, similarly when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived and when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away as well, there wasn't any set calendars. What used to happen in Arabia was that in Arabia they used to remember their days according to the incidents, some great incidents took place in the history and from there they used to count their days. For example, 
uh, sahaba they would uh, narrate the uh, birth of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because they never had any calendars so they will narrate the birth of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam from the incident of elephant uh, prior to the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the incident of elephant took place. A uh, uh, governor of the uh, uh, Ethiopian uh, empire from uh, Yemen, whose name was uh, um, uh, Abraha, okay, he uh, came to Makkah al-Mukarramah to demolish uh, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Makkah al-Mukarramah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Surah Al-Fil on the end of the 30th Jews, which we sometimes recite in the Quran. Allah ta'ala has said, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka biyasha bil-fil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that uh, in that incident uh, the people, about the people of the elephant. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's birth actually took place 50 days after the incident of the elephant. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the king uh, Abraha with his uh, army and with his troop, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed him. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born after 50 days after that. So Arabs and Sahaba, Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jama'in, they never had any set calendars. They will always uh, remember the days by something big, major happen in the history. And from there, they will calculate the days and then the weeks and then the months. And then uh, they will uh, try to preserve and remember the history. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came as well, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not set any calendar. Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, they would remember the days again uh, by major incidents. Like uh, Sahaba in the early Islam, uh, they will say this happened before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to the house of Al-Arqam radiyallahu ta'ala anhu to preach Islam. Some of them they will say uh, this happened when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to Al-Mis Isra wal-Mi'raj. Some of them will say this happened when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was socially boycotted. Some will say this happened when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's uncle Abu Talib passed away, etc, etc. Some will say uh, this happened when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's wife, Sayyida Khadijah al-Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha, she passed away. It happened before this or it happened be after that. And on top of that, uh, when Hijrah took place, when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated from Makkah al-Mukarramah, uh, when he was 53 years old uh, and it was the 13th, 13th. 13th year after the Nubuwa, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received prophethood. So when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Makkah al uh, Madin al Madinat al Munawwara, so now Sahaba they would say that this happened before the migration and this happened after the migration. Somebody who embraced Islam they will relate as that he embraced Islam before the migration or sometimes they will say this group of people they embrace Islam after the migration, etc. etc. So Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa they never had any set calendars. They will, uh, however, they will uh, uh, remember their days and uh, record their days with the uh, major incident happened uh, prior to that uh, date, i.e. Uh, the months or the years uh, before that. And this is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left the world. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, did not set any calendar. However, as Islam is concerned, Islam has prescribed uh, many of its rituals according to the lunar calendar. Islam, uh, of course, we pray our daily salah according to the timings of the solar calendar, uh, which is according to the sun. For example, we pray our Fajr Salah around 1 hour 40, 45 minutes prior to the sunrise, which is the Subh Sadiq, which is the early dawn, we pray our Fajr Salah. And then we pray our Duhar Salah, Midday Salah, straight after Zenith. And then we pray our Asr Salah when the shadow of every element becomes double. And we pray our Maghrib Salah uh, at the time of, after the time of sunset. And we pray our Isha Salah around 1 hour 30 or 30, 40 minutes, uh, 30 or 35 or 40 minutes past the sunset. So as far as the daily prayers are concerned, they are prayed according to the uh, uh, sun timings, the, lunar, uh, the solar timings. However, the rituals such as fasting in the month of Ramadan, such as performing the Hajj, etc etc similarly giving zakat as well we follow the lunar calendar we follow the lunar calendar and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created both of these calendars uh, the solar calendar and the lunar calendar 
However, as the Islam is concerned, Islam is the unique uh, deed which is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Islam and uh, uh, the follower of the Islam, Muslims, everything unique. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't allow Muslims to borrow things from other people. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them self-sufficient. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them everything unique. The book is unique. The prophet is unique. The teaching of Islam is unique. The sharia is unique. The calendar is unique as well. Everyone else in the world, they are following the solar calendars. As far as we are concerned, we are following the lunar calendars. Now, ulama, they have raised this concern and, in fact, the question in order to understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather than giving us a solar calendar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected for the Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected for them the lunar calendar. In one of the surah of the Quran, which is known as Surah Tawbah, in the juice number 10 of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he created the world, the universe, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the timings. In one of those verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created 12 months. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created 12 months as for timekeeping. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst those, out of those 12 months, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made arba'atun hurum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made four months dignified. So in the, throughout the Islamic calendar, we have 12 months, beginning from Muharram, Safar, Rabi'un al-Awwal, Rabi'ul Thani, Jamad al-Ula, Jamad al-Ukhra, Rajab, Sha'ban, Ramadan, Shawwal, Zul Qa'da, Zul Hijjah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made 12 months and out of these 12 months Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made four of them sacred. Four of them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made dignified and respect, respected. The three come in a row and one is separate. Those three come in a row which are the sacred months, which are the respected month. They are Zul Qa'da, Zul Hijjah, Muharram and the old one is Rajab. So Zul Qa'da, Zul Hijjah, Muharram and the old one which is separate from the, the group which is Rajab. So they are the four months. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made them in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made them as respected, as dignified. And as far as the months of Hajj are concerned, they are Shawwal, Zul Qa'da and the first ten days of Zul Hijjah. The first ten days of Zul Hijjah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that in the system of the universe, in the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the, uh, put, uh, uh, the place, uh, in place the system of 12 months, which uh, uh, actually rotate around the year, and we have these 12 months. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not set any calendar. And the Sahaba, Ridanullahi alayhi wa jama'een, they did not ask as well Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for any calendars. And they were just calculating their dates according to the major incident happened. Like this happened before uh, migration to Mac Al Madinah al Munawwara. This happened after the uh, uh, migration to Al Madinah al Munawwara. This happened before the Battle of Uhud. This happened after the Battle of Uhud. This happened before the Battle of Trench. This happened after the Battle of Trench, etc., etc. This is how Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi uh, ajma'in they were calculating their dates. When Sayyidina Umar, uh, Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, anhu, the first Khalif of Islam, he became Khalif as well. Sayyidina uh, Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, anhu, as well, did not set any calendars. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote in the taqdeer, in the fate, uh, many things for Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Allah wanted to give many credits to Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu became Khalif and Islam started to expand out of the Arabia and it went all the way out of the Arabia, Africa, Africa and then Asia and many. It went all the way to Morocco and all the way to the sides of China and to India. The whole Islamic bloc was created. Now Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala and whose time Islam expanded and Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala and who had many of his governors all over the place. Now at that time the need of a calendar uh, actually exists and it, 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 it was uh, desperately needed. One of the Sahabi by the name Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala and who he wrote a letter to Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala and who. We don't have any time now for break, inshallah? Uh, uh, sure, Sheikh. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm very, very much interested to learn the history and stuff. But uh, it's time for a short break. Inshallah. We need to go for a short break. Okay, I do apologize to interrupt no you. Uh, dear viewers, it's time for a short break. We're listening and some interesting facts and figures about the Islamic calendars. We hope to continue that after a short break. Please stay with us and continue the show. Take, till then, take care.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dear viewers, welcome back at the second segment of our This Week's Islam and Life. Today, we're listening and discussing about the history of Islamic calendar. We're learning lots of things about the Islamic calendar and we'll continue to do so, inshallah. To discuss and give us some knowledge about the Islamic calendar and the other relevant issues. Today, at the studio, our regular guest, the Honorable Vice Principal of Jami Islam at Birmingham, Sheikh Faizul Huk Abdulaziz, is present here. Let's welcome him once again. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi Sheikh, we are listening about the history of Islamic calendar, but also this segment will take some calls from our audience. No problem. Dear audience, if you have any questions regarding the Islamic issues or anything which is very relevant to your believer's life, you can put your put uh, the questions forward to our show and we'll try to answer them live directly. The number will be given at the screen. It's, let me recite that once again. The number is 0207 096 0405. And also, you can watch our show on YouTube. Just put the name of the show Islam and Life and the date of the show. I hope you'll find it very easily at the Ikra Bangla YouTube page. Also, you can, if you miss our show and if you don't want to miss it, and if you think that you cannot watch it on the television, you can watch it on Facebook Live. Just go to the Ikra Bangla Facebook page and you'll find it there, inshallah. So without further delay, let's continue on today's topic. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, please put forward and we'll try to answer them accordingly, inshallah. Please share. As, as I learned lots of things about the facts of Islamic calendars, just to remind on the fact that Islamic calendar is based on the lunar calendar, That's not true. the solar calendar. No. Lunar calendar. And also, it, prior to the Islamic calendar, it depends on the uh, major events, mm -hmm. including the birth of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Battle of Uhud, the Battle of Trench, and the others. Mm -hmm. So it surrounded all the, all the counting of the calendars surrounded by those things. Now mm. we'll, we'll learn why the Sahabas, Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, while he expanding his um, region throughout mm. the world and expanding the uh, Islamic Khilafa. So why he chose the event of Hijrah? <laughs> and we'll continue to Barakallah. learn about that. Please put no some problem. light. Jazakallah. Brothers and sisters, so before the break, we are discussing that uh, what was the background of Islamic calendar. So we discussed that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. Uh, the calendar wasn't set. So you know, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the first caliph of Islam, he also passed away and the ca Islamic calendar was not set. When Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he became Khalif, and as, as I said earlier on, that Islamic uh, land expanded and the Khilafah expanded from Morocco all the way to the borders of China and India. So it was a, a huge uh, land. In, in fact, the whole center of the world, it was under the shade of the Islamic Khilafah. And Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he had governors all over the place. Now, at that time, the need of uh, Islamic calendar or set, setting a calendar, uh, it was on its peak and the Sahaba, they needed actually uh, an official calendar to be set in order to keep the track of the records of the many things. So, a Sahabi of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a companion of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by the name Sayyiduna, Umar ibn, uh, Sayyiduna Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he wrote a letter to the second caliph, Sayyiduna uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala, writing that, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers, many a times you send us letters and commands, and we respond back to you as well, we reply back to you as well. But it becomes difficult for us to track when actually you send that command to us, and it becomes difficult for you as well to track when we have actually sent that reply back to you, because there is not in any date written in there. There isn't any date written in there. For example, if the person sends the letter and he writes the date on top, then there is, it's easy uh, for tracking that when the person has actually sent the letter. Similarly, if the person sends the reply as well, and if the date is written on top, then it's easy to track that when the person has actually sent the reply back. So Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu ta'ala anhu raised this concern to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifat al-Muslimin, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, saying that, uh, that it is quite concerning for us that when you actually send the commands to us and how quick you want the reply from us. 
because there is not any date so it becomes difficult for us to track and for you to track as well so you know Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu took this into consideration and as Islamic command is wa amruhum shura baynahum that Islam always gives importance to the consultation, the consultation of the uh, uh, people. Uh, so Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu sat down with the Majlis al-Shura, the consultative or the legislative committee of the Khilafah. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu sat down and he discussed the issue, he raised the issue that this has come uh, uh, forth, that there is a need of setting a calendar, uh, the need is getting uh, large and large and great and great, what should we do? So all the Sahaba in the presence of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they agreed that yes, it's logical, it's rational, uh, and, and there is a need, a great need for setting an Islamic calendar, we should set an Islamic calendar. So all the Sahaba agreed that uh, uh, we should set an Islamic calendar. Now what happened next, before I touch that, I'll say, as far as the Islamic calendar is concerned, as you mentioned the after break as well, it rotates with the, uh, with the moon. It's a lunar calendar. It doesn't go with the sun, which is not a, it is not a solar calendar. Now ulama, they have mentioned many of the reasons that why Allah Ta'ala, rather than uh, setting a, a solar calendar for the believers, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has set a lunar calendar for the believers. Ulama, they have given many, many of the reasons. One of the reasons could be, that in moon, in crescent, and when it's full moon, there is big lessons every day for the people to take. For example, when the crescent becomes para, uh, apparent on the first day of the month, okay, before that day, few days before that, there is nothing in the, in the horizon, there is nothing, no moon day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by this giving a lesson to the human, that we're human, this is your beginning as well. Once upon a time, you never existed, then you existed in the universe. I brought you to existence. And you are very tiny little like the crescent. Then what happens? The crescent gradually, gradually gets big, 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 big. And then when the 13th and the 14th and the 15th of the Arabic month comes, mashallah, it's like a round circle, full moon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by this indicating and uh, teaching the humans that once upon a time you never ex existed. I got you into existence and then gradually, 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 I made you big. And then Allah ta'ala has said in the Quran, Fasawaka rajula. Now you are a tall man, Allahu Akbar. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the man, Inna ka lan al arda wa lan al jibala tula. That, oh man, I have gave you the completeness. I have made you complete. Therefore, do not show uh, arrogance to the people and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that you cannot rip apart the, part the, the, the world of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Neither you can be as tall as the mountain. So there is nothing to boast about. Always remember your origin. That what you were before and who has got you into existence and who had made you a complete man. So from there, from the different sizes of the and different shapes of the crescent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a lesson to the entire human being that take a lesson from the crescent. That it doesn't exist, then it comes into existence and then it's very tiny and it gradually gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then mashallah end of the day in the in the middle of the month it becomes a, a big full moon so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the lesson to the humans like that as well and then after the after the middle of the month what happens the moon start to get decreased again it gets decreased 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 night by night night by night night by night at the end of the month around 25th to 26th it disappears from the horizon allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving another lesson to the entire humanity this will be you as well that you are very big men now until the age of the 40, mashallah, you are a very big strong man. But as soon as you reach the 40, things started to get weak in you. From the age of 50, more weak. From the age of 60, more weak. From the age of 70, <laughs> you consider yourself to be the people of grave. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the second part of the month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives lesson through the moon to every individual that every rise has a fall. Every strong man has a weakness to come. Allahu Akbar. Like the moon is full, shining, subhanAllah, but it decreases, 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 decreases. End of the month, it disappears from the horizon. A time will come that a man, very strong man, they will have the high peaks, but a time will come, they will not remain in the universe anymore. Allahu Akbar. And many of the men, like uh, in the history when past, they, they were the men of the the, you, you can call them uh, uh, Iron Man. They were the man of the power. The man, they were the man with the strength. But finally, end of the days, everybody has gone. Everybody has to leave this universe. The man who called himself as Ana Rabbukum al-A'la. I am your exalted Lord, Pharaoh. 
Pharaoh, Pharaoh for example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved his body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Al yawma nunajika bi badanika litakuna liman khalfaka aya. From today, we'll preserve your body. So your body can be assigned for the people to come until the end of the days. And still the body of Pharaoh is preserved in the museum in Egypt. Allahu Akbar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the second part of the moon, Allah, second part of the month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a lesson to the entire humanity. Just take lesson from the moon that is full and circle, round, but it decreases, decreases, decreases. End of the month, it disappears from the horizon. So you as men as well, once upon a time, the death will strike you and you'll disappear from the world. Allahu Akbar. Allah. Second scientific reason, uh, many of the scientists they have mentioned, as far as the sunshine is concerned, it makes the fruit go ripe. The mangoes, jackfruits, the pineapples, etc., they become ripe because of the sunshine. However, as far as the sweetness is concerned, it comes from the moonlight. So the mango is sweet is because of the moonlight. The jackfruit is sweet, sweet because of the moonlight, etc., etc. So as far as the sweetness is concerned, it comes through the moonlight. So this is the system which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put uh, into place. There could be many other reasons as well. Uh, many of the scholars uh, who talk about the Islamic days and the month and the calendar, they always give this wisdom. But of course, above everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is the real wisdom behind. We can only comprehend things which are catchable by our uh, uh, weak mind. All obvious, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ahkamul hakimin. He is the, uh, he's full of wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the actual reasons behind it. So my brothers and my sisters, coming back to the uh, point again, that uh, uh, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala on whose time, uh, he gave the suggestion to send the calendar, Sahaba agreed. Now Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala on who, as you touched it uh, after the break, that why for a hijrah? And why for a Muharram? So Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala on who uh, left the issue in the parliament, in the house, for everyone to take part in the discussion. So he said, okay, the, 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 uh, the topic is open. Everyone can give the suggestion. When should we actually begin? For what point should we begin the Islamic calendar from? And for which month? Two things. For what point and for which month? First suggestion came, some people gave the suggestion that begin it from the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When this suggestion came, the house did not accept that. Due to the reason, in Islam, celebrating birthdays, it doesn't exist. If you want to celebrate birthdays in one year, you have to have, you have to have more than 100,000 days. Then you can celebrate because there is more than 100,000 prophets and there is more than 100,000 sahaba. So you need every single day to celebrate because every day will be somebody's date of birth and somebody's date of death. And only 365 days you can't do that. So therefore, this is not the Islamic motive, Islamic ethos to celebrate dates, uh, date of birth and date of death and anniversaries. And these, Islam gives more importance to the more important issues rather than these celebrations. So this was with, withheld. Second opinion came that uh, let's begin the calendar, calculate the calendar from the day Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became Prophet. The house again did not agree with this one. Because the reason was given that as far as Muslims are concerned and people who are religious, they always like to uh, remember the weak point of their life rather than the uh, enjoying and the happy and the strong points of their life. This is, this is the uh, motive of the believer that they always like to remember the weak point. So this was again withheld. Some people gave the suggestion that uh, begin the calendar from the uh, death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, when it came to the house, the parliament didn't ag agree with that. Why? Because Islam doesn't give any kind of uh, commemoration of the uh, death anniversaries as well. Birth anniversaries, death anniversaries, this is not from the Islamic uh, custom. Birth is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the will of Allah. Death is also caused by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, it doesn't have any importance that you have to celebrate the birthdays and the uh, death anniversaries. So some, the fourth opinion came from the next to Sahabi who are going to be Khalif on the row. From Sayyiduna Uthman and Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. They both gave the suggestion to Sayyiduna uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu saying that Ya Minal Mu'mineen, we have a uh, op uh, opinion and suggestion and that is begin the Islamic calendar, calculating the Islamic calendar, start calculating it from the Hijrah, from the migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When these two suggestions from the two of the great uh, Sahabi who were to be uh, Khalif in the rotation, 
when it came to the public to the to the house to the parliament so you know ibn al-khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said yes this point looks very nice let's discuss about it so all the sahaba took part in the discussion and they all agreed after a lot of discussion yes the point uh, the starting point of the islamic calendar it should be the hijra it should be the migration of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from al madinatul munawwara uh, from makkah al mukarrama to al madinatul munawwara sasakala so, shaykh we are listening it but uh, at the main time we should take a call of course we have no a call on the line let's take Barakallah. it assalamu alaykum caller wa alaykum assalam i yep. want to know when is the best time to do ishraq namaz and Salatu Duha. Okay, okay. Zazakallah so, sister, do you have any other questions? No. Zazakallah no, so, sister, our Sheikh will answer that, inshallah. The best time for Ishraq Namaz and Salatu Duha. MashaAllah. Uh, we'll, 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 uh, do you want to answer it now? Or, I'll answer it, uh, Please, inshallah. please. Sister, I'll ask you a question. When is the best time for Ishraq and Salatu Duha? Uh, straight after uh, sunrise, sister, straight after sunrise, around 15 minutes after the sunrise, uh, the Salah normally people pray, that is known as Al-Ishraq. And furthermore, uh, towards the uh, middle of the day, before the middle of the day, the Salah you pray, that is known as al duha So after sunrise, around 15 minutes after the sunrise, from there you pray any Salah, which is in the early morning, that Salah is known as Al-Ishraq. And furthermore, down the line, around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, the Salah you pray, that is known as al duha so the late morning salah, nafal salah, optional salah you pray, that is Abduha, and the early morning salah you pray, that is known as Al-Ishraq. Al-Ishraq means the brightness of the sun. So when the sun rises and the brightness starts to spread, the salah you pray, that is known as Al-Ishraq. And furthermore, down the line, around 10, 11 o'clock, the salah you pray when the uh, sun is fully burning and the late morning, that is known as Abduha. Barakallah. Sazakallah, Shaykh. From this answer, it's clear that there is a sign of intelligence, knowledge, there because your prayer has been rotating throughout the sun if the prayer has been rotating throughout the moon it would be very difficult for the believers don't you think i know so? because they will, will, will be able to pray at night time, <laughs> night time. <laughs> no no <laughs> salah during the day, <laughs> day. <laughs> subhanallah subhanallah mm. and and if uh, and and also if uh, we should follow the solar calendar in terms of the month of ramadan every year the month of Ramadan would be in the summer. Ah, that is be very difficult for there some people. That was the a point. Uh, Jazakallah for reminding me. That's, that's another wisdom as well. That why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the lunar calendar, not the solar calendar. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to choose the solar calendar, then the month of Ramadan and Hajj will only be sticking to one season only. So for example, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to make the Ramadan in the month of June, it will be every time in the summer. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to make the Hajj in the month of August, it will be every year in the month of August. Because of uh, giving the command of uh, choosing it in the lunar calendar, we have the flexibility of uh, doing it all over the year. Because uh, every 36 year, the, the calendar comes to its beginning point. So for example, uh, if this year, uh, uh, 1st of September, it was the uh, Eid al-Adha day, after 36 years, the Eid al-Adha will fall again on the, on the 1st of September. Are you with me? So after 36 years, the rotation comes to an end. So we have a flexibility of keeping the fast in the summer season, in the autumn season, in the winter season, in the spring season, in different months of the year. Same we have the uh, flexibility of uh, performing Hajj in the summer season, in the winter season, in the autumn season, in the spring season, and different months of the year. This is another wisdom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had. Barakallah. Zazakallah, Sheikh. We'll put some light on that. Let's take a call on the call. Assalamu alaikum, caller. Hello, Salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam. I want to let me know when you start to. Hello, Salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to let me know I'm very sick of the act before Dubuk, before Fajr, before Isha, before Makhrib. Okay, the second sister. I have. What was the question? I can. I can ask. We're not clear. Could you please, could you please say it again? Yeah, I'm very all the time before Fajr to Raqqa. And before Dur Turqa, and before Makhrib Turqa, and before Ish Turqa. Okay, you pray so, every two rakats before every prayer, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So what's the question? Uh, so what was the que questions? Why do you pray? Yeah, I want to that Kastar Sheikh say when you sing it every day you pray, you have a Kastar. Okay, I'll explain that. Okay, okay, I, I, okay. Think I, uh, sisters, I, I think, think sister is trying to say that uh, what's the virtue of praying the uh, sunnah before sunnah. the salah and after the eat salah? What is the virtue of that? I think this is what she's trying to say. 
جزاك الله سيدا in the hadith رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم has mentioned that whoever prays twelve rakah before the first salah or after the first salah which are known as sunnah muakkida the emphasized sunnah رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم has said in the hadith that بنى الله له بيتا في الجنة that Allah سبحانه وتعالى will make a house for that individual in Jannah. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam every day before Fajr Salah, the farad, compulsory two rakat of Fajr Salah, before that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will pray two rakat of Sunnah. Before the Dhuhr Salah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will pray four rakat of Sunnah. After the Maghrib Salah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sorry, after the Dhuhr Salah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will pray two rakat of Sunnah. So altogether eight. Two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, six, and two after Dhuhr, eight, and two after Maghrib, ten, and two after Isha, twelve. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that whoever prays these uh, regularly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a house for that individual in Jannah. Barakallah. Jazakallah, Shaykh. I think we have another caller on the line. Let's take that call. Assalamu alaikum, caller. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum yes, brother, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, uh, huzur jo salam kui ba amar. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amar kunu question na yami just tanja hello kui ba alaikum kun borsi. Barakallah, jazakallah khair. Amra ya ehsati umra khusna wana ma abdul alim. Mashallah, barakallah, jazakallah isaf, barakallah. Tham shate. Wa shakallah. Jazakallah. Wa shakallah. Wa shakallah. Wa shakallah. Inshallah. 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 Thank you. Thank you brother. Thank you very much for your compliment. Sheikh, as we, we, we are just discussing about the uh, solar calendar, what mm -hmm. was the difference it could make mm -hmm. to, to daily life of a believers and also the yearly uh, mm -hmm. rituals in mm -hmm. terms of the Hajj and uh, Ramadan. Ramadan. So it's, it's also geographically it's very important. Mm -hmm. if, if we celebrate uh, a certain days of um, uh, every year as a Ramadan in the, in the solar calendar, then the friends of mine, Australi Australian friends, they could have a very small days, mm -hmm. and the friends of US, they could have a very long days. <laughs> and also, all the time, people who travel to Australia or the south part of the world, <laughs> to, you know, to, to have take the advantage to, of the short days. Yes, exactly. Okay. That that could be the happens. And Allah so never know. <laughs> so Allah knows. Allah is the best of the planners. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allahu khairul makinin. Allah makes the best plan. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows, and we can only dig out the wisdoms uh, which falls behind. So Islam the, believes uh, in equality to every aspect of life. There you go. Mashallah. Barakallah. Very nice bullet point. Hayyakallah. <laughs> so my brothers and my sisters. Sorry to interrupt okay, you once no again. We have another caller on the line. Let's take Mashallah. it. Salamu alaikum, caller. Hello, assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam, brother. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. If you don't mind, can I speak in Bangladesh? Yeah, yeah would prefer English if you could say so, please. All right then. Um, if anybody, uh, if anybody couldn't, uh, which is the man? If anybody couldn't, uh, um, is Akika, yeah? Mm -hmm. Is that compulsory or not? Okay, Zazakallah, so brother. Thank you very okay. much for the questions. We do, we do understand that. Our Sheikh will answer that, inshallah, in a, in, in, in a very good form, inshallah. Sheikh, oh uh, uh, you had the questions. It's if anybody doesn't do mm -hmm. the akika, mm -hmm. is it compulsory to do that? And what is the ruling? If you enable it, Mashallah, Jazakallah khair. The brother has asked a question that uh, if somebody didn't do akika, what he should do? And what is the ruling of akika? My brother, as far as akika is concerned, is a uh, sunnah. It's a recommended sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it meant to be done on the, after the birth of the child on the 7th. If it's not, then on the 14th. And if it's not, then on the 21st of the uh, 21st day after the child birth. And it is the recommended sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did the aqiqah for his two grandsons, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Therefore, it is recommended to do sun, uh, the aqiqah. If somebody has somehow missed that, okay, now obviously the time has gone. Uh, we can, uh, inshallah, a person will not be seen there is no qada for it but however if somebody willingly wants to donate something to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's totally up to him but the time has gone there is no qada as well uh, there is no need to do it because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't do it uh, as a qada and didn't tell us to do any qada as well so therefore a person doesn't have to do any qada but for uh, like making himself content if he wants to give some donation in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is allowed Jazakumullah khair Jazakallah khairan shaykh thank you very much for answering the questions as we are discussing about the wisdom behind behind the choosing even a calendar mm -hmm. it's a day life it's a very wise thing for the believers like Allah give all the signs for the believers in everywhere mm -hmm. so as a history of calendar you were mentioning that we got a suggestions from two third and the fourth caliph in 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 line 
On that time, th were they choose that time? No, no they were not choose. They're they're not choose. Later they, on, they became Later, they became, because of their wisdom, yeah. because of their knowledge, yeah. and because of their dedication to the beliefs. Mm. So, what will happen then? The parliament decided to have the, yeah. these. Jazakallah khair. So, I'll come to the point. So, when Sayyiduna Uthman and Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, they gave the suggestion that we should begin the Islamic calendar, the starting point should be the migration, the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Makkah al mukarramah to al Madinah al munawwara not the birth, not the uh, day he became prophet, not the death, in fact the hijrah. So when this uh, 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 bill came to the parliament and all the other sahaba took, uh, uh, took actually uh, uh, participate in the discussion, so sahaba and uh, Khalifa al muslimin Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they agreed that yes, we should take the uh, Islamic calendar from this point, from the uh, migration point. And the wisdom, the thought behind that was that as believers, we should always look for the uh, weak point of the life, that when we are weak, when we are beaten. So before Sahaba Ridhanullahi migrated to Al Madinat al Munawwara, they were living in Makkah al Mukarramah. Okay? And in Makkah al Mukarramah, they were uh, beaten, they were, uh, they were uh, persecuted, they were tortured, they were hit because of embracing Islam. After coming to Al Madinat al Munawwara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them stability. So all the Sahaba agreed that let's start the Islamic calendar from the point of Hijrah. Jazakallah Khairan Sheikh. I think it's, we are at the very end of our second segment. Allah so we will have one, one segment and okay. we have some questions already. Inshallah. So we'll try to answer them at the third and final segments and we'll some to get some more knowledge about the history of Islamic Inshallah. calendar. Inshallah. Before that, I shall, let me take a short Inshallah. break for that. Inshallah. Dear viewers, we are learning lots of things at the meantime and we are getting some questions and we are learning at the same time. And so I think... Um, all of we should participate into their learnings and be part of our show. Please stay with us. We'll come back shortly after a very short break. Till then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers, welcome to the last and final segment of our this week's Islam and Life. I'm your host Raju Ali. Once again, we are discussing about a very important topic, which is uh, we, w from this topic we can learn lots of things about the history of Islam. And also, it's not only about the history of Islam, the importance of the topic and also the, 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 the relevance it's in our life. The topic is history of Islamic calendar. In the meantime, we are, tr we are trying to answer some qu questions which we received through phone calls and now at the third and final segments we already received some questions through our social media by email so we'll try to answer them inshallah accordingly and the answer will be given by the honorable vice principal of Jamia Islam at Birmingham Sheikh Faisal Hook Abdul Aziz he's a very knowledgeable person and we are very delighted to have him on our board every every week and we we hope you will answer them accordingly inshallah and before going to the discussion of our today's topic We'd um, just invite him once again to the, our show. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum, assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, we learn lots of things about the history of Islamic calendar, the suggestion board, and we also find out some key facts about the Islamic history. That Islamic history allows us consultation. Hmm. It allows us. So not only it does allow, it only it commands. It's it now commands. 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 It's commands. And it also did. Uh, not there is a surah in the Holy Quran called Ashura. Ashura. Which is really consultation. Consultation. That means you do consult mm. consult with the people of knowledge, mm -hmm. and also follow the the, the, the democratic way. Mm -hmm. It's the people of uh, the who knows it, mm -hmm. get it, the knowledge from who mm -hmm. knows it. So we learn lots of things about them, and and even the Khalif that time took suggestions mm -hmm. from the normal Sahabas mm. later who became the Khalif because mm -hmm. of their wisdom. Mm -hmm. So we learn these are the key facts. Mm -hmm. and there's a sign of the lunar calendars the sign of life mm -hmm. and the solar calendar it's a time we should follow mm -hmm. so in the meantime we received some questions okay. we'll answer them accordingly Inshallah. in a brief i would request you to shorten the history of calendar we could talk know, a lot know, but in the, in the meantime i'd, I'd request okay. you to shorten because we Maraka, have some questions no problem, around like so we'd like to answer please no problem. So brothers and sisters, when the Sahaba agreed that uh, where to start the calendar from, so all the Sahaba they agreed let's start from the uh, migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now comes the question, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. So the starting month should be Rabi'ul Awwal. Why is it Muharram? Muharram suffer Rabi'ul Awwal. Why two months early? Muharram. So Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu after the consultation with all the Sahaba, 
they discovered that the preparation for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to migrate, he actually started from the month of Muharram. He actually started from the month of Muharram. Therefore, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the other Sahaba, they suggested for the month of Muharram. Second reason could be, as far as the month of Muharram is concerned, in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that Shahrullah al-Muharram, the month of Allah which is al-Muharram, which is uh, dignity and the respect indicating for the month of Muharram, that Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu calls it the month of Allah. So that's the dignity of the month of Muharram. Third reason could be in the month of Muharram, there is a day which is known as Ashura which is one of the great important uh, things happen not only uh, in Islamic history, throughout the history as well. Many of the great of the things happen in the, uh, in the uh, month of, in the day, in the 10th of Muharram, which is Ashura. So because of all this significant, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started preparation for the month of Muharram. And when Sahaba, they set the calendar, they started from the month of Muharram. Now the Muharram is the first month of the Islamic calendar and the last month of the Islamic calendar is Zul Hijjah. Uh, could be that fourth reason as well, that as far as Zul Hijjah is concerned, in Zul Hijjah we perform the last command of Islam, which is Hajj. And after that, let's begin the year, which is Muharram, could be the reason as well. Therefore, the Sahaba, they agreed to begin the Islamic calendar from the month of Muharram. And we have a call? Yes, uh, sorry to interrupt, Chef, no once again, I think we have a call on the line. Exactly the call. Assalamu alaikum, caller. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum I'd like to... Um, Make one question. Yes, please. And um, it's a is the Hara Kobala Gaki, Istahaki Lahonaki. As do I, Mr. Hara, it's a Faralak Bunina, Hari, you know, Kuvala de Fulibo. The Zakala Hari, the Hotohanaki, a good money, the Nash, the Shamosh from the Hoibo, the Takita Hotohanaki, Hasa Uiboki. Okay, oh, okay. sister, our Sheikh will try to answer them, inshallah. Inshallah, Sheikh, I think uh, we should continue the topic because it's okay, very inshallah. end of uh, okay, yeah, very, very I will give the answer, yes. inshallah. Jazakallah khair. So as far as uh, my brothers and my sisters, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the second khalif, with the suggestion of the third khalif, Usman ibn Affar, and the suggestion of the fourth khalif, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and all the other sahaba in the presence of the sahaba, they uh, agreed to begin the Islamic calendar from the migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, and then they appointed month of Muharram as the first uh, month of the Islamic calendar. There could be many reasons why uh, from the Hijrah, why the Hijrah was selected. Uh, number one, the reason could be as far as the Hijrah is concerned, Hijrah is the, uh, is the biggest sign that a person loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person dedicates everything, sacrifices everything and lives uh, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, goes in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a, a, a dedication. Whenever the Islamic New Year comes, it gives us a lesson that you should dedicate and sacrifice everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, second reason it could be uh, as far as hijrah is concerned Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in the hadith uh, that at the time of fitna worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ka hijratin ilayya is like migrating to me to al madinatul munawwara now we are going through the, the time of the uh, 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 fitna, the time of the trials, the time of the tribulations, when the ummah is facing so much of the difficulties that ummah and the humanity at large has never has faced any of these kind of uh, difficulties. At that time, we should be more engaging ourselves in the worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and drawing nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank oh, yeah. you very much for giving so much knowledge about the history Barakallah of the calendar. Barakallah. Now we receive some questions Inshallah. from our audience. So mm -hmm. let me put the questions forward for Inshallah. you, please. Um, the first question is, is men allowed to have uh, wear jewelry? <laughs> Subhanallah. <laughs> A very nice question. Somebody has asked, is men allowed to wear any kind of jewelry? Mashallah. My brothers and my sisters, as far as men is concerned, <laughs> in converted commerce, we are actually deprived from many of the rights, which our sisters, mashallah, they enjoy those rights. As far as sisters are concerned, they are allowed to wear the bangles, they are allowed to wear the uh, ring on the nose, in the ears, and the rings, and the necklaces, and the uh, anklets, everything they are allowed. Whereas men, we are not allowed to wear anything besides only one ring. Only one ring. And that ring as well, uh, made only from silver. 
and the weight is also given by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that you are allowed to only wear one ring, and that ring is from uh, silver, and the weight of that ring shouldn't be more than a mithqal, and a mithqal is just less than four grams just less than four grams so as men we are only allowed to wear as a jewelry only one ring nothing else and we can wear it on these two fingers either the uh, little finger of the right or the uh, ring finger of the right or the little finger of the left or the uh, ring finger of the left rasulullah never wore a ring on these three fingers the in middle the index and the thumb Prophet never wore Similarly, uh, uh, many times I see many people wearing three, four rings. Okay, this is against the Sunnah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he wore, he only wore one. Okay, and uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well, another Sunnah as well. If Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore a ring, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will keep the stone inside his palm like this, and the ring from the outside, because this is less showing off. If you have an expensive stone on your engraved on your ring and you're wearing it, it could be the intention that showing off. So as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to turn it down, other way around, and he used to hide it. So these are the uh, guidelines given by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam for men however as a watch is concerned because watch is more of uh, keeping the time than comparing it as a jewelry so as a watch because of the time uh, therefore for men the watch is allowed uh, besides that only one ring and uh, <laughs> this is how we have to be patient what with that. would be the stone what kind of stone we should uh, stone could be see. anything however uh, normally uh, stone uh, uh, the rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam had is it was a stone made in uh, in uh, ethiopia in habasha in the Arab hadith word it says habasha uh, which was from ethiopia could be the stone which known in our our, our language as aqiq could be the stone because they used to be in the time of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that used to be very famous for making those stones okay so as far as men as jewelry is concerned only one ring which is made from silver shouldn't be more than one mithqal less than 4 grams in weight the oh, yeah, and men can have some jewelry, any kind of jewelry like gold or like gold bars or biscuits and stuff. Not for wearing, for business of business, course. Of business, course. not yeah. for wearing. Not nothing, for wearing. nothing is allowed for men. Nothing is allowed. So, Ishaq, just to interrupt, I think we have a caller on the line. Let's take call. Yes, Assalamu alaikum, caller. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Oh, sorry. I think we lost the caller okay. and somehow. Yes, uh, Sheikh. As 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 uh, we have another questions on mm -hmm. the line. Let's take it. Any any special question to to actions. to do? Any special actions to do in in, in the month of Muharram? Mashallah. Uh, as the uh, month of Muharram has already started. Today is the third of month of Muharram. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the hadith that after the month of Ramadan, the best fasting they are in the Shahrullah al Muharram. They are in the month of Muharram. So when the month of Muharram begins, uh, normally Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa will fast every Mondays and every Thursdays. In the month of Muharram, we can increase that. We can try to increase and uh, fast as often as possible, or at least not to miss Mondays and Thursdays, because this was the former and sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So this is one of the action which is throughout the month of Muharram, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, after the, uh, the month of Ramadan, the best fasting is in the month of Muharram. Second thing which we should do, it is to fast on the uh, day of Ashura. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he went to al madinatul Munawwara, he saw the uh, Jewish people, they were fasting uh, on the Ashura day. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, uh, questioned them that why you are fasting. So they replied, on this day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protected Musa, uh, Moses, Musa alayhi salatu wa sallam from the punishment of Pharaoh and Bani Israel from the punishment of Pharaoh. Therefore, as gratefulness, we observe this day as fasting. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, we are more close to Musa alayhi salatu wa sallam compared to you guys because you have left the path of Musa alayhi salatu wa sallam. Therefore, we, should, uh, we are more close to Musa alayhi salatu wa sallam. And then he said, if I was to be alive next year, we will fast either 9th on the 10th. 9th and the 10th together. Therefore, ulama, they have said that fasting on the Ashura, a person should fast either 9th or the 10th. And if he has missed 9th, then 10th and 11th. So 9th or 10th or 10th or 11th is the wish of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Just to clarify, it's 9th and 10th, 2, 2, 2, 2, two, two, yeah, two, two, two yeah. So 9th and 10th or 10th or, or 11th, 11. okay? 9th is known as Tasu'a and 10th uh, is known as Ashura. So 9th and 10th or 10th and 11th. Or this year it will be 9th and 10th, this year will be uh, coming Friday and Saturday. Coming uh, Friday will be 9th and coming Saturday will be 10th, okay? Uh, 
the virtue of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever fast on the day of Ashura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I hope, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the past year's sins. So because of fasting on the day of Ashura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the past year's sins. Therefore, uh, we should try our level best to fast coming Friday and Saturday together as the wish of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not to fast only one day, fast two days, 9th and 10th, or if 9th is missed, then 10th and 11th. In, 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 in the sense... Uh, is it could be Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, in that sense it could be Saturday and Sunday. Sunday. Otherwise, Friday, Saturday. This for only for this hijrah. This yeah. hijrah, yeah, this hijrah. Yeah. Like Obviously, it's going to be every uh, <laughs> yes, uh, ninth yes, and tenth. Yes. So and days will be uh, different. <laughs> we have, uh, we just got a questions from the control room that uh, though we do not allow any kind of asking about the meaning of the names okay. or the meaning of the dreams, okay. we do not allow them. But one one of our sisters, uh, she, she asked, can she keep the baby's name Tanha? Talha. Talha or Tanha? Talha, I think it's Talha. Talha, talha. is an Talha, yeah. Tanha. Yes, it's ta Tanha N. And tanha. Tanha. Oh, Tanha is a Urdu word, which Urdu. means which means lonely. Lonely. Okay, so, so Tanha is a, is a Hindi or a Urdu word, which means lonely. And if it is, if it was a Talha, so it's the name of a great Sahabi, they of course they can keep it. And if it is Tanha, is Tanha is, in, is a translation of the Arabic word Farid. Okay, so they might as well keep the name as Farid rather than keeping Tanha. Tanha means lonely, alone. Uh, so keep it as uh, Farid in Arabic. Arabic. So yeah. Zakala Khairan. Though, uh, dear viewers, we do not uh, encourage people to ask the name mi meanings of the names and the dreams. Please uh, be aware about that. Zakala Khairan. Sheikh, um, we have another question. We have a series of questions. We, we have a very little of time. We'll try to answer them, inshallah. Uh, what is the ruling of Sajdat Law? or the sujood mm -hmm. while we are hearing it live? <laughs> Very nice question. Someone has asked a question that if he or she, they hear the ayat of the Sajidah Tilawa uh, recited live, what is the ruling of it? My brothers and my sisters, if you, recite, if you hear the ayat of the Sayyidah Tilawa uh, getting uh, recited live on a television uh, uh, channel or whatever case from your masjid as well, from the masjid radio scanners or on the television channel, if it is live, then you have to do a Sajidah. You have to do a sajida because it's live, therefore you have to do a sajida. So therefore, as soon as you hear the ayat of sajida being recited and you are in the state of wudu, you prostrate uh, straight down uh, like we normally do. However, if you don't have wudu, then make wudu and then do a sajida. It becomes due on you, it becomes wajib on you. However, if it is from a recorded element, for example, you open your uh, mobile smartphone and from there you are listening from YouTube, which is not live. Okay, or from a cassette player, or from a CD player, or whatever case it is, or from a radio as well, which is not live. If it is not live, then the Sajidah Tilawa doesn't become due. You don't have to do it. However, if it is live, then it becomes uh, wajib, compulsory. You have to do it, like as if you are listening directly from another person reciting the Quran. Mr. Oh, yeah. um, what is the ruling if someone visiting the grave or reciting Quran? Like, okay, can, can someone recite Quran while they're visiting grave? Mashallah, very nice question. Somebody has asked that uh, uh, if somebody goes to visit the grave, okay, then uh, is he allowed to recite the Quran? My brothers and my sisters, once we go to visit the grave, we recite the dua which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited, which is uh, Assalamu alaykum ya ahl al-qubur min al-muslimina wal muslimat antum lana salaf wa nahnu lakum taba' inna insha'allahu bikum lahiqoon nas'arullah lana wa lakum al-afiyya. This is the dua which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to recite. Once you are there, Remember that when we go to the grave, there is two purposes of going to the grave. Number one is to take the ibra, take the heed. That a time will come, I will be also buried in the same land. Okay? So take the ibra, take the lesson, take the heed, and take a preparation. Okay? So that's the first thing we do. In the hadith, Rasulullah said that fa innaha tudakkirul akhirah. Visiting the grave reminds you of the hereafter. Second reason uh, once we go to the grave is that to benefit the people who are dead. Those people who are dead, obvious, they have deprived from the good deeds. Now they cannot do anything. Whatever they have gone with, whatever they have sent when they were alive, that's it. They don't have anything to do, any, any, any good to take with them now. Therefore, once we go there, that uh, it is allowed for somebody to recite any portion of the Holy Quran, okay, and then make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facing the qibla, that wallah, whatever I have recited, Allah please give the reward of this thing to the fellow uh, brothers and sisters who are buried in this grave. Therefore, it is allowed. Because in the hadith, it does not uh, uh, prevent, doesn't say that you, when you are in the grave, you cannot recite. Therefore, it is allowed. If somebody goes there uh, and then he recites something and then he uh, makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Allah, whatever I have recited, please Allah give the reward to the deceased, to the dead people who are buried in this grave. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take the 
a reward in the account for the people who are buried in there. So it is allowed. However, to think it's compulsory or to certain things that I have to decide this bit or that bit, to uh, set it from yourself, it is not allowed because there's nothing which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said. Therefore, you can just recite anything out there, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Ikhlas, Surah Zilzal, whatever you want. For a long time a person goes but the main thing of my brothers and my sisters when we go to the grave it should be to take the heed not to make the videography not to make the photography not to make and make a make it like a picnic zone astaghfirullah alazim we should make it only for the purpose of taking the heed uh, and be prepared for the hereafter barakallah uh, we received a question right now about through what is the importance of salat al-duha salat al-duha mashallah Somebody has asked uh, that what is the importance of Salat al-Duha. My brothers and my sisters, as far as Salat al-Duha is concerned, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will pray it regularly. And sometimes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will miss it as well. Okay, so Salat al-Duha is, is a proven sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Minimum Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would read two. Maximum is proven from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam up to eight rakat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would decide them. As far as Salat al-Duha is concerned, in one of the hadiths, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that uh, uh, in the human body, there are many limbs. When somebody prays Salat al-Duha, he fulfills the rights of those limbs by giving thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, as far as Salat al-Duha is concerned, it's a recommended sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, everyone should try their level best to pray uh, Salat al-Duha whenever it is possible because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has prayed Salat al-Duha. Barakallah. Jazakallah We have another question, I think. Um, am I really... Oh, it's about the issues of the Rohingyas uh, mm -hmm. someone is very hard in terms of the Rohingya issues okay. the, what if, if someone is hard mm -hmm. even even every one of us is hard mm. what should you do Allah uh, brother or sister has asked that she or he uh, they are very much hard with the uh, heart with the Rohingya issues uh, at the moment uh, and they are very much of in grief and actually everyone is actually like have you seen that uh, video which was going around in whatsapp yesterday day before yesterday or probably a week ago uh, english lady oh yes. she has made a, she, she has, has made, made, a, made a, video. a video in her kitchen i think and she was crying her eyes out that why our media why our everything is just shut down they are just quiet not speaking about and then she made mention of a thing that she show in one show so in one of the videos that somebody was throwing a baby in the fire like normally people will throw uh, a ripped shoe Allah and then she uh, was uh, weeping and crying so as far as the humanity is concerned my brothers everyone who has the humanity inside everyone who has the human soul inside they are all around the globe they are saddened by the incidents taking place around the globe nowadays but i think the last majority of the uh, human population in the world uh, they have lost the uh, lost the spirit of the humanity now and no one is doing uh, anything or the, uh, the what should be they're doing so everyone is hurt in this case my brothers and my sisters first of all we could do is make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that dua could change many of the things uh, first of all we make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dua includes the repentance as well because the in Ummah, all these uh, um, calamities have uh, fallen because of the bad deeds of the Ummah. So we should uh, collectively return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make a repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, uh, remember those brothers and sisters, uh, uh, the victim brothers and sisters, by supporting them. So uh, many of the registered charities who are uh, collecting the donations, send uh, donations through them, so these brothers and sisters uh, can be helped in their old times, in their need times. Remember that in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu Allah has said that Allah uh, helps, helps his servants as long as the servants they help the other uh, brothers. Therefore, whenever we help any one victim, Allah will help us as well. And the third thing, my brothers and my sisters, we can do uh, is by uh, meeting our local leaders, the MPs, uh, by writing them, by sending emails to them, to our ministers, to our prime minister, and to the leaders of the world that at least do something, at least uh, by prevent. And uh, fourthly, we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, take the people who are victim and they are displaced their places Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take them back to their loved ones and to their land in uh, peace and security and uh, uh, and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them peace barakallah Sazakallah so, Sheikh thank you very much we do not have enough time Allah but Akbar. today as we discussed about the history of Islamic calendar one word came in front of us hijra so last question for today what is the meaning of hijra Allah Akbar. Mashallah. 
as far as hijra is concerned hijra literally means to leave something it has two meaning one is the physical meaning which is leaving your land <coughs> for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you cannot practice Islam in a particular land. And second meaning is <coughs> sorry about that. <coughs> second meaning of hijrah is uh, to leave sins. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to repent to Allah and leave all the sins. The, sorry, sorry, sorry to <coughs> sorry about that. Sorry about that. No, it's, it happens. It's a live show, dear viewers. It's a live show. It happens sometimes. <coughs> it's very hard to talk uh, when we're live. Zazakallah, Sheikh. You are doing very hard work for the may show. Allah accept. May, Allah accept. Uh, may Allah accept that and uh, give us the week to Amin. continue the show. Amin. So, Sheikh, uh, Hijra means leaving something behind for leaving the sake of behind. Allah to practice the deen. Practice the deen. So, with this mark. And the second one means, uh, second meaning of Hijra means leaving the sins, those things which displease Allah, leaving them. Uh, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zazakallah khairan shaykh. Thank you very much. We are very pleased that with the difficulties uh, you answered it very correctly, very nicely and very humbly. Marikum. And we are at the very end of our today's show. So I would like to thank you once again and let's finish the show inshallah for today and we'll continue it in the next week. So inshallah. Dear viewers, we are at the very end of our today's show. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions, please put forward in the comment section of our Facebook page any regarding any shows of Ikra Bangla. If Ikra Bangla is your channel, please stay with Ikra Bangla and stay with Al Khair Foundation. Till then, for the next show, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.